Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. We're very special guests. We've got Francis Ampofo, former British and Commonwealth flyweight champion, and his son Archie, who's just about to start training for his own amateur career. Start with you, Francis. Just tell us a bit about how you first got into the sport and, and what led you to the pro game eventually. Well, um, in fact, um, I used to go to a school in um, East London, Bethnal Green, and that place was full of fighters. Michael Watson, the Cray Trains, and I thought I need to defend myself because it's all bullying and stuff going on. So one day I went in the um, Lion Boys Club and said I like to train boxing. That was it really. Where's that Lion Boys Club? It's Hoxton. It's, it's up in Hoxton, um, Old Street, Hoxton, yeah, Piffy Street. And Roy McDonald was there and he said, all right, we'll take you up. That was it really. And how many amateur fights did you have? Because obviously in the lighter weights, was it a struggle to get fights? I, yeah, I did struggle to get a um, fight because um, for flyweight, I used to hit very hard and it was hard for me to get fights. So I ended up maybe 22 amateur fights, that's all. But did that force you to turn pro earlier than you would have if you'd been able to get more experience as an amateur? Um, no, because my style didn't really suit the amateur. I was too ragged, too, so I was losing a lot of fights on the amateurs on points. If it goes to points, there was no way I was going to get it because it's, my style was too rugged and bad. Um, and I had my last fight was actually against John Lyon. I don't know if you remember this kid. Very good fighter. And someone came up to me and said to me, the pro game is not for you. You're, too, you're not fast enough for amateur. You should, go, you should go pro. So that was it really. John Lyon's the Manchester guy, right? The Craig Lyon's dad. I think he's from St. Oh, okay. St. Albans. He won the ABAs possibly nine times. Yeah, like amateur legend, amateur, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was actually the 1988 Olympics captain. So tell, tell us a bit about who you worked with as a pro in terms of your trainer and your promoter. Well, as a pro, I started off with um, Charlie Magrin first, and then Dean Power was up and down with um, amateur and pro. Then I did a bit of work with Jimmy Tips as well, fantastic trainer. And then, um, I mean, pro, I was, I was at home much for 12 years. Much I started off with um, um, Charlie Magri, then I went off with Georgie Patrick, and then Alice Gow. Yeah. When you look at Matchroom now and the massive events they're putting on, how big boxing's becoming on British TV, do you wish you'd been around in this era more so than your own? Definitely. I think. Um, I would have done a lot, lot more, I would have won a lot more fights. So I think it's slowly, I can't say it's easy. It's, <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's, it'd be a lot more easier than then. I mean, we had people like Baby Jake, Michael Carver, Paul, 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 um, Paul Weir, good fighters. And I think um, it would have been a lot easier now <laughs> than then, yeah. And looking at your career, you had um, the five defeats at the end before you retired. Do you think you went on a little bit too long? Would you like to have retired earlier? No, because um, I did have a plan to what, when, when I wanted to... to ret well, I didn't have a plan. I knew as soon as I stopped enjoying boxing, it was time to stop. And I think all this time I was fighting, I was still enjoying it. So the time we came for me to retire, which was when I was 35, that, then I've had enough. Archie, let me ask you, how aware were you of your dad's history and quite what level he'd accomplished were you as you were growing up? Well, it took me a while because when I was, until I got to about 11 years old, I, obviously I knew he was a boxer, but I wasn't that interested in it. But like, I never really watched boxing. I remember, I think until I was about, 12, one of the only fights I'd watch on TV was Ricky Hatton and Floyd Mayweather, that was it. And then as soon as I started getting into a bit more, I watched like, all his fights on YouTube, look at all. I like, look, I like watching old fighters as well. So people from his era, people like Jason Matthews and Wayne Alexander. And then I just get into, more, get into boxing a bit more from there. Now I'm really into it and yeah, I love watching all these old fights. And when did you decide to actually give it a go yourself? Um, well, around that time when I was younger, I did kind of want to give it a go, but my dad always wanted me to wait for me to be a bit older. 
because he thinks you can, if you start later, you can go on for a bit longer, a bit more fresh. So when I was about 17, I started training then, down in Norwich, and still training now, yeah. Before you started training at 17 in Norwich, had you done anything with your dad, like pads and stuff at home or anything like that? Had he shown you any tricks? Yeah, he showed me like the stance, how to hold yourself, footwork, but never anything too serious. And have you watched back a lot of your dad's old fights? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I watched them back, like the old fights with Robbie Regan, Johnny Armour, Baby Jake. So yeah, I, I do watch them on YouTube, yeah. How different do you think it is, Francis, breaking into boxing now in 2018 for your son than when you broke in yourself? And also the fact that he's in Norwich, you were in East London. I think um, it would be a lot easier now for him to break into it, into boxing because I think um, the, the, level, the quality is not as hard as when I was boxing. For, for me to get into London level was so hard because there was so much um, competition in there. For, for anyone to get into even Olympic level, it, it's, it's impossible to be in the game just for four years, like the boys now. For them to get in the Olympics, they've only been there four years. When I was fighting, some of them have been there for 12 years before they even get a fight. I mean, it's people like Wayne McCullough. At 17, it was fantastic. It was fantastic, and I think the boys now getting into the Olympics, they're not even at the level that he was. So I think um, boxing will be a lot easier now for him to get up on top. On top. You've got three kids. Are you proud and happy that one of them's following in your footsteps in boxing? Or is there a part of you that wishes they'd gone into other pursuits instead? Because obviously boxing's a dangerous sport, it was hard, you know what it's like, you know how hard it is. Well, even, even up to now, I know he's sitting here now, but I've watched him spar once the first time and um, every punch he took, I felt it. And I swear I did not want him to fight a single bit. Even, even now, I think I'll be more nervous if, when he gets in the ring than when I was fighting myself. So I'm not, um, but the way he's been taught, I think he can handle himself now. I'm a lot more relaxed now from, from what I've taught him and from what I've seen him doing inspiring. And I think he'll be able to handle himself. But in the past, where he's been, I wasn't too keen on him. You're going to take your medical soon. We're also off to university to do your BA um, up in Sheffield Hallam. Where does boxing fit into the grand plan? At this stage, is it still just a hobby for you or do you see it going somewhere further in the future? Well, as soon as... I get in Sheffield and I'm going to train up there a lot of the time and I'm going to card be carded with the Lion Boys Club in London. So I want to keep on training. I'm training every day now, see how it goes, have a fight and just keep training, keep training as long as I'm enjoying it, just see how it goes, see where it takes me. And as you mentioned Francis, you guys live up in Norwich now, or near Norwich, you can tell us a little bit about that, but what provoked the move from out of London up there, what, what made you go up there? Well, it did, this, this is a long story actually, it's um, me and her behind, back in the 90s, we used to talk about what we're going to do after boxing, and we knew loads of gypsies, and they had loads of land and chickens, and I thought, I like that, maybe when I finish boxing, that's what I wanted to do. So I've always had that in my head, that after boxing, I want to have a chicken farm. So I first had a farm in Brentwood, Essex, very close to Barrowhead. But I couldn't get my planning going, planning permission. And I see a chicken, come, chicken farm come up for sale in Norwich. So I bought that before actually my last fight. So I knew win or, win or lose, that was it. I've had enough of boxing. I was going to a chicken farm. And that's how I ended up in Norfolk. I saw a farm for sale, bought it, and went out there. And I believe you're quite close to, to Herbie Hyde. You live quite near each other still. Just tell us a bit about the lifestyle now on the farm, chicken farming. I'm guessing it pays the bills. What's it like in terms of quality of life? You, you look like you really enjoy it. It's fantastic. There's no London, there's London smoke everywhere. We live right in the countryside and um, no neighbours, which is very good because I've got autistic son and something. And he does cause a lot of shouting and screaming and all that. So, yeah, I mean, 
living in countryside is fantastic. Yeah, it's the best thing ever. Best thing. And where does your produce go to? So like your chickens or your eggs or whatever, do you go to like supermarkets? How, how does it work? Well, um, when we had the food, food um, stock, we had 10,000 birds and I had a, there was a middleman that the eggs, all the eggs goes to, which is 9,000 eggs a day, goes to middleman and he, put, he sent them off to like places like all the supermarkets, top supermarkets. Um, I, I don't think I'm supposed to name them, but okay. it's um, all the top supermarkets, all my eggs used to go to. So what, ha what, what happens now? Because you said you used well, to, so. Well, now, because um, they've put a road behind my land, which took away seven acres of the land, which means it, it, it has reduced the amount of birds I can have, which, which made me lose my contract, because I haven't got enough eggs for them to come over to pick him up so I'm waiting till I rebuild my shed and go back to maybe 16,000 birds and I'll get my contract back so at the moment we've only got small amounts we've only got about three from next week we have about 3,000 birds and I'm only selling them from the gate which is the gate of the farm okay so you're still kind of keeping things going but you're yeah. back to bigger things quite soon yes yes at, at the moment like while I'm here Emma and the Olivia's running the farm. Then once we get, normally we all run it, run the farm. So. Good stuff. And just getting back to boxing, just just a couple of quick ones. What's the best fight you've had, or best victory? And who who was your toughest opponent? The best fight I had, possibly against Dan Firefield. Okay. Dan Firefield, I thought um, I was well in control. I knew what I was doing. I was well in control. Everything was nice and calm. And the hardest fight I would say is Baby Jake Matlala, which I think I made a big, big mistake. Which um, normally when I fight, I never go back, I go forward. With Jake, I sparred him a long time before I fought him. And what I should have done is stick to my plans, what my usual fight is go forward and meet him in the middle and just fight. I decided to box, and that's not my style and it got to me in the end. It's, it, maybe it would have got to me anyway because he's a great fighter. And I've been out for 14 months. I haven't fought for 14 months. And then it got to me, how's it really? Any regrets from your career? Not a single bit. If I had a chance, I would do it all over again. The same promoter, the same trainer, the same everything. Except maybe I'd like to be a heavyweight. <laughs> fight, <laughs> fight people like Herbie Hyde. Mike Tyson, I love to be there. Make more money, eat what you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> funny, funny you say that about more money. I didn't actually realize there was money in, in box where they, I didn't make that much out of boxing. But it wasn't all. It wasn't about money with me. It was about becoming a champion. I first, when I first saw Charlie Magri's Longsdale belt, because he used to train me as an amateur, I thought that's what I want. The Longsdale belt. And he said to me, well, you'd have to turn pro, be very good, and then you win one of those. So that was my target, to win a Longsdale belt. So was Charlie the trainer at the Lion then? Yes, he came to, well, he came to Lion and trained me for maybe the last two years of my amateur career. Okay. Yeah. And Archie, just the last one for you. How similar is your style to your dad's? I think it's probably quite different because we're very different, like, shape. shape. Yeah. yeah. He was like smaller stockier and he's he was always a fighter he's come forward and fight but my dad's trying to teach me all different styles so in the gym we'll practice stalking someone down then having a round where you need to box on the back foot move about as much as possible so we're just trying to learn it all really and what weight are you going to be well I'm currently 10 stones so maybe lightweight maybe lightweight and what um how tall are you i'm five foot ten Wow, that's a, that's a big uh, lightweight if you make lightweight. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably. So we're practicing on that, like using the jab, having long reach advantage. Brilliant. Well, we wish you both the best of luck. It's been great to see you here at the Peacock Gym. Probably brings back some memories for you. And um, yeah, best of luck with the chicken farming, getting your contract back. And best of luck with your degree and your burgeoning amateur career. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah.